Welcome back to the shop and to the channel. Well, in the last video, you saw me make a fixture for machining this 12 inch cast iron straight edge. And my goal is to try to machine all of the surfaces I want to machine in a single setup. And with all of the pieces here for this fixture complete, I can go ahead and mount up the straight edge and we'll dial it in and take some other measurements. Well, I have this sort of dialed in, I guess you could say by eye, and I just wanted to see just how flat it is. So I've got a dial indicator on the knife edge of the prism, and I'm just running the table down to see if I need to make any adjustments. Well, it looks like this is actually really close. I'm not sure I'm going to need to shim it, at least not in this axis. It does look like the center of it, however, is about 40 thousandths lower than the two outside edges, which, you know, happens in a casting like this. But overall, the, you know, knife edge on, on here is fairly consistent with the webbing so that's a good sign well the next thing I want to do is check the bottom of it so I've moved the dial over to the flat and we'll run the table down just to see what kind of deflection we may or may not see here Well, as luck would have it, doing this by eye has yielded some decent results, although it does appear that there's a bit of a hump of about 10 thousandths in the middle of the casting, or at least where I'm running this dial. Well, we know that this thing is fairly flat lengthwise, but widthwise, um, it's kind of about the same. It looks like there's a bit of a hump in the middle of about 40 thousandths, but it's not too out of square. Mind you, I didn't do any fettling. I didn't file down any of the uh, parting lines. So again, I think we got pretty lucky with this casting. Um, it's fairly consistent. Well, since I've got the dial now on the opposite end of the flat, let's go ahead and run it down the length again. And just like the top part of it, it looks like we got about a 20 or 30 thousandths hump in the middle. But other than that, again, I think it's fairly consistent. Well, I think this fixture is working out much better than I had expected. So we'll make sure everything's appropriately tight and we can start machining all these surfaces. Well, the first surface I want to machine is the large flat surface. So I have a tool holder here. I'm making sure first that the spindle taper is clean and the tool holder itself is clean. And we'll get it mounted here and tighten it down with the draw bar. Well, this is the same face mill that I just used to machine the fixture. And I bought this particular tool specifically for this job. And also knowing that I would be able to use it in both an R8 um, shank as well as this NMTB40 shank. 
I do need to swap out these inserts from these ones here that are more for hardened steel or mild steel to a set that uh, is better for, at least in my experience, as limited as it is with cast iron and aluminum. Probably unnecessary, but I added these one, two, three blocks and some strap clamps just to give this a little bit more rigidity and hope to prevent this thing from having any lateral movement, either front and back or side to side. Well, the feeds and speeds calculator would suggest that I should be able to run this thing at 600 RPM, somewhere around there. However, I don't really want to run it that fast. Um, I'm going to run it actually a little bit slower um, so we'll adjust here with the transmission and set this to 336 rpm well because i know this has a bit of a bow in it in the center i'm going to touch off there and then I can feed in from there knowing I won't end up taking off too much in the middle and end up running into, you know, other issues. So I think it's a safe bet just to start in the center. Well, I can't really see what the cutter's doing from the front of the machine, which is where I need to stand. So I'm using this mirror. Um, on a telescoping handle just so I can try to get a better view of the cutter and the surface that we're trying to machine. I'm feeding in about 30 to 40 thousandths here on this first pass. And I'm also being a little conservative on my feed rate. Well, that first pass went really good, so I think I'll go ahead and feed in another 30 thousandths. I'm going to take another pass here of 30 thousandths and then evaluate if I need to go any further. Well, I think those other cuts uh, were going fine, but I want to take a little bit of a finishing pass here. So I'm going to 
change this up and increase speed to 550 RPM and also slow down my feed rate to about three and a half inches per minute. Well, the surface does have these swirls in it, these machining swirls, but I cannot feel them. So I don't, I don't think they're a problem. I'm not sure what's really causing them. Um, I feel like this setup is pretty rigid, even though it's aluminum fixture. So I, I think this is just machining marks because you can't feel anything in the surface. Of course, we're gonna know for sure when I blew this up to start scraping it in. With the bottom now finished, I can move on to the back. So I've taken the face mill out of the spindle and swapped it with an end mill. And I think this was a 5 8 end mill, to be honest, I can't remember. But I need now to get this in position so I can start machining the back. I'm a little concerned that I might have to machine into some of that aluminum, but that was part of the reason why I decided to use these aluminum step blocks instead of making them out of steel. Well, as they say, clearance is clearance. Looks like I'm going to have plenty of clearance for this end mill. I won't be machining into the aluminum step blocks at all. Um, but I just need to use a mirror and a flashlight to see how well this is turning out. I want to make sure I machine enough of the back away to clear out that occlusion I noticed and I showed in the first video. Um, if I don't get it all, that's okay. Uh, I should be able to get the majority of it. Hopefully there will be no others that will show up in the casting. Well, it's not physically necessary for me to machine the sides of the straight edge, but it is from an aesthetic point of view. I do want to give the bottom of this thing have nice, crisp, clean corners on all four edges. And in order to do that, I really feel like it's necessary to machine the sides. So uh, we've got the table now moving up. It's one thing that's nice about this KNT is that I have power feeds in all three axes. So I'm using that to my advantage so I can set a nice feed rate and machine the sides. Well, I don't want to machine too much of this away. So when I get the prism edge machined, I'll come back and look at this again and decide if I'm going to take off any more. And I think that's a good stopping point here. Now I'll traverse the table down to the other end so I can machine the other side. Well, if I'm going to reach my goal of machining all these surfaces in one setup, I need to use the universal head for the KNT. This is the setup that I have for the drive gear for the universal head that uses the gear that was made for me by my friend Cooper. Well, because of the way that this was made, the gear teeth on this are not consistent. There's some differences in thickness and it was a good experiment on Cooper's part, but it created some problems on the KNT. I also received some criticism, rightly so, that these drive dogs, which I had to fasten with these countersunk cap screws, are a weak point 
and could potentially be ripped off under high torque. A viewer and real machinist, Tom from Tom's Rabbit Hole YouTube, linked down in the description, reached out and said, hey, I know you have some problems with that gear and I can remake it for you. While Tom has quite the setup with his homemade gear hob, it is an incredible device. So he remade the gear using a hob and also made it a little bit thicker so that I can machine in the drive dog so they're integral to the gear itself. That way it takes away that weak point. And before I said yes, I reached out to Cooper and I wanted to let him know that I appreciated the favor that he had done for me. And I honestly wanted to make sure he was okay with me replacing his gear. And he was excited that somebody else was going to come along and hopefully resolve some of the issues that I've been having. So the first thing I need to do to make this gear work is I need to machine out everything except what's needed for the drive dogs. I've got some blue dicom on here and I'm just scratching some lines just to create sort of some anti-bozo marks so I don't go too crazy with the end mills. So I'm going to machine these drive dogs from the outside in. Uh, I have the gear blank centered over the spindle, or at least the DRO set up so that the zeros are over the center of the bore of the gear. And I'm just going to take some 50 thousandths depth of cut passes um, from the front and the back and then gradually work my way to the center. take a quick measurement here with some calipers just to see how close I am this needs to be 5 8 of an inch thick so 625 thousandths it can be a little bit under that but it can't be over that because it has to fit into the slots on the nose of the spindle well we'll get a little bit closer to that target dimension I'm not going to get all the way on it I'm going to leave uh, 10 or 20 thousandths for on each side for a final pass once I get it to depth.
Well, I've switched out to a smaller end mill in the hopes of getting a little bit of a better finish and to go ahead and take everything to final dimension. The last thing I need to do here with the drive dogs is to machine out the center of them so that they fit over the centering plug that this mounts to. I'll give this a quick test fit in the spindle and there's just the tiniest bit of play in the width of the drive dogs which is perfect. Well the last thing I need to do here is drill and tap the four mounting holes for this disc which sets the mesh between the driven and the drive gear. I won't bore you with this whole process, we'll just include a few clips. Well, put a little Loctite on these screws and mount all this together. And this should hopefully be the last time I ever need to deal with, with this gear and mounting it. I really can't thank Tom from Tom's Rabbit Hole enough for making this new gear for me. And I hope you'll check out his YouTube channel. I have provided a link. Give him a subscribe and go check out what he's been able to accomplish. It's quite amazing. Well, I got the drive gear mounted in the spindle so I can complete the machining operations on the straight edge. But before I get into that, let's get the universal head mounted up and show you a little bit about what it can do. Well, my universal head is parked on a parking attachment on the side of the machine and it's got a little crane that attaches to the top of it that allows me to swing it over. I've got the overarms retracted all the way and I just spread these clamps on the drive bracket and I give it a little bit of a tilt up so that the driven gear sits down on top of that drive gear. I'm just going to loosely tighten the bolts here for the drive bracket. I don't want to clamp these down fully just yet. Well, the next thing I need to do is slide the overarms into the swivel support bracket. Uh, the reason why I leave that clamp loose is sometimes you've got to kind of finagle it in just a little bit. Well, this screw that's on the top of the crane lets me adjust sort of the height and angle of the universal head. And by kind of giving this a little bit of an adjustment, it helps me line up those holes 
in the swivel support bracket so the overarms can slide in. Although this video makes it look much worse than it really is, it's bad. I need to level this machine. I used to have a wedge under one corner of the base and somehow that got kicked loose. I need to get that put back in. With the overarm seated in the swivel support bracket now I can go ahead and tighten these clamps. And now I can tighten these nuts here on the top of the swivel support bracket that clamps it down onto the overarms. And then lastly, tighten down the clamps for the overarms themselves. And now this thing is all ready to go but it has some other features which I think are interesting. Well, I'm loosening the bolts that clamp the drive bracket onto the column of the machine. I've already loosened the clamp um, bolt that's on the top of the machine that clamps the overarms themselves into place. And now there's this other bolt on the front that if I loosen it, and swing it out of the way I can pull this entire head away from the column of the machine there's a sliding shaft in there that once I tighten these clamp bolts back down I can run this milling head now away from the column of the machine it vastly increases the flexibility of this milling head by giving it a little bit more of a range of use. I just need to reverse everything I just did and I can slide this back into place, reclamp everything and we can move on with our project. I have relocated the end mill that I used to machine the back and the sides of the straight edge into the milling head now that it's mounted on the machine and it's angled at 45 degrees so we can cut the prism face of the straight edge. Well astute viewers may have noticed that I failed in my mission to machine this straight edge in one setup. Well, it seems I had miscalculated and with the milling head on the machine and this end mill in place, the straight edge, I could not bring the table forward enough to actually meet it with the end mill. It basically moved this whole thing about two inches too far back toward the column. So I had no choice but to remove the fixture from the back of the table and move it to the center slot of the table. So I did have to spend a little bit of time with the dial indicator, tapping this back into alignment with the travel of the table. It didn't take too long, but I was a little disappointed. I wasn't able to meet my goal of machining this in one setup. And had I started with the straight edge mounted in the center slot to begin with, I wouldn't have been able to use the face mill because the face mill would not have reached. I would have ended up having to use another end mill or find a 40 taper holder that would push that face mill out by another two inches, three inches. So if I ever have to do another one of these again, I'll know to start with it in the center and I'll just have to use a traditional end mill. Well, the last thing I want to machine here are these pads that are on the top of the straight edge. So I've readjusted the milling head so it's now at 90 degrees and I have a nice long 
solid carbide end mill in another end mill holder and we'll take care of both of these in just a few passes. Well, I think I'm finished with all of the machine work, so it's safe to go ahead and remove this fixture from the table, and I'll take it over to the uh, bench and see what I have. Went ahead and brought the entire fixture over to the workbench. We'll go ahead and remove these socket head cap screws that hold the straight edge down to the aluminum step blocks. I think these edges could use a little deburring. Um, I thought about squaring up these pads on the top, but I think I prefer the, the roughness of the sides. So I just wanted to clean up the top of it but the machining did raise a little bit of a burr, so just a quick uh, pass over with a file and that'll clean that up. I also wanna deburr all the edges here on the bottom, especially this front edge, which is pretty sharp. Well, I probably should have fettled this down a little bit before I did all this machine work to remove some of these parting lines, but quite frankly, they don't really bother me too much. But I think if I were to do this again, I would clean these parting lines up completely ahead of time with a file and do it like Joe Pizinski does and then sandblast it again to give it that, you know, dimpled cast iron look from the sand. Well, I think the only thing I have left to do before I start scraping this is to take it over to the surface plate and do a little inspection on it. Well, I brought it over here to the surface plate and just doing sort of a simple pivot test. And this looks promising. It's pivoting you know, a little bit inboard from the side. This side over here, maybe not so much. Maybe I'll put some blue down and we'll see how it blues up. So I put some of my um, bluing compound on the surface plate. And this is on here pretty heavy because I want it to make some kind of um, color on the bottom. So I expect it to be heavy. This is not anything for any precision work. Just kind of giving me an idea of where I'm at. Well, and to be honest with you, I'm a little bit surprised. I expected this to be A, a little bit better. But B, also, I didn't really expect those machining swirls to be as deep as they are. And they obviously are. Otherwise, I wouldn't have had as much transfer on it. And while I'm here, I'll check the top tabs just to see where that's at. And those don't look too bad. Those might not need too much work. I cleaned off the surface plate here, and I have a test indicator on a height gauge. And I just want to see just how parallel these tabs are. And with the zero set, it looks like... Uh, yeah, it looks like it's not quite parallel to the surface plate. You know, it looks like I'm about two thousandths on this side and we're probably two thousandths over here on this side out of parallel. Uh, that's okay. Once I get the bottom scraped in, 
we'll look at getting this top scraped in parallel with the bottom. But I'm not too worried about it. That's more aesthetics than it is functional. Well, I was hoping for better results here, but you know, it is what it is. Uh, it is machined. The scraping is really where all this comes into play. And it just means I'm gonna have a little bit more work in the scraping than I was hoping. Well, I'm not 100% sure if I'm going to do a video on the scraping on this straight edge. If you'd like to see that, drop a comment down below. And if I get enough positive responses, I'll go ahead and look at doing a video. But that's it for this week. If you like the video, give it a thumbs up. If you're not a subscriber, consider subscribing and hit that bell icon so you get notified when I drop a new video. And a special thanks to those that are helping out with the channel through Patreon and PayPal. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you on the next one.